in which interval does the EGIM biological age calculation takes resting heart rate into account or VO2 max into account or also update their, their EGIM strength age if you do a one rep max test. So these were a couple of questions I had and luckily there was currently, as of today, as after my training, a sales rep basically in or somewhat of an somewhat who instructs basically the, the personnel in many gyms uh, for the eGym uh, environment or the eGym devices. For those who don't know, eGym is basically a company that makes for one software solutions for gym chains. This could be their the, the side of the software solution that is on the side of the gym, then also on the side of the user. So they make my gym chains app. And so I have a biological age calculation based on flexibility. Uh, cardiovascular age, metabolic age, as well as strength age, that then results in an overall age of, in my case, 24, compared to my actual age of 27. So the first question I ask, and maybe I have to explain my current routine of using this. I currently train three times a week, the same resistance training whole body. And before this, I take uh, a strength tests of the shorter, not the shorter, but the smaller gym E not gym, e-gym circle. So this is a rotation. So you do kind of these devices in rotation. And I do only a one rep max test also to kind of gauge at my power output at this given day. Now, the first question I had was, which what, which would be the time interval? E-gym basically uh, uses this then. And what he mentioned and what came out of this discussion is that every time you update your biological age there, even if you just have a bad day, uh, then this is your current biological marker, which then contributes to the strength age. Which means if you also have a variance in, in the testing, for example, sometimes you do it in the morning, sometimes you have breakfast, sometimes you have carbs for breakfast and, and not, and sometimes you might have a bad night of sleep, then there might be a vari variability or a variance in terms of uh, your one rep max, in terms of the kilograms you can actually pull and push. So this might then uh, negatively impact this. One solution I had thought up and I initially thought that they would do something like this would be that they had kind of weights attributed to the different historical data points. So that maybe the last data point would be weighted then with 0.2 or maybe it would take the days and then actually weigh them accordingly to the days and maybe throw I don't know, maybe you have uh, an exponential an exponential curve where the highest value would be maybe one, the value from, I don't know, two weeks ago would maybe be 0 0.5 and so on and so forth. And then these weights would contribute to an overall uh, to an overall data point of this specific marker. Let's say it's how much I am able to pull. And this would then result in this current marker, which then contributes to the biological age. But it seems there is no such thing in implementation. Now you can additionally input your own reps. So there are only these six machines. There is a bigger circle that is also available, which is with nine machines. So the small circle is pushing, is rowing, is leg extension and leg, I don't know, the other one. And then you also have back extension as well as stomach or abdominal, abdomin abdominal crunch, I think it is called. Then the bigger circle comes with an additional let an additional, I just had a cramp here, an additional lat, uh, and then there are two other things as well. The first one is a leg press, and the last one I can't remember right now. Now, the question I had was, if I now took a test of these additional machines, which are not available uh, in my gym, then what would happen with these data points? And it is similar to how basically the rest of this would also be constructed. With the rest of this, I mean, so you can input maybe how many squats you do, for example, and this would then calculate a one rep max for your squats. This would also be calculated in the biological age. Now, if I take an additional test, then basically the last value, the, the most update, updated value is taken into account as long as I don't overwrite it. As soon as I overwrite it, so let's say I do, I'm do, i doing these six machines in my gym three times a week, then every data point that is uh, overwriting that is basically more current overwrites the last one with uh, the last ones being completely gone in terms of the impact but if you have an old data point that hasn't been overwritten then this is still taken into account so I for example did uh, do normal bench press because I usually do only incline 
and then this data point st st still probably seems, not probably, but at least according to him, still seems to be included in the current biological age calculation. And the same would be true for going to different machines. So to the to these three additional machines, maybe taking a lag press, a one rep max test, and a test at a different facility. And then this would still be kind of included in the data, at least up until the next data point entry of this specific marker. Then. One of the next question, and this is kind of in a similar in a similar similar realm, was that what what would be the ideal? So currently, in order to explain this, I have to say that currently I update the rest of my markers, which I have to manually input once a week. This seems to be a somewhat reasonable cycle. So on a Saturday, I take I take circumference measurements, and two of these I then input into the eGym metabolic age. The rest is taken. The rest in terms of the metabolic age is now. Uh, kind of automated with uh, an in-body scale in my gym, which is a bioimpedance scale that in addition to just standing on it also has handles that basically shoots a current through your thumbs. So therefore also records the body composition of your upper body and takes that into account compared to the normal bioimpedance scale I also have at home, which just takes the lower body into account. So the question here was that what if, so the question here in terms of the metabolic age, but not so much in terms of the metabolic, but more in terms of the cardiovascular age, because now I do already have basically scheduled one weekly in-body measurement at my gym, which I can now take in a kind of self-service fashion. So I kind of replaced this with previously putting in my body fat also once weekly from my bioimpedance scale. Now, in terms of taking resting heart rate, uh, VO2 max, as well as your resting, not resting, but also kind of resting blood pressure, because it is also the resting value, uh, because otherwise your blood pressure would const constantly go up and down, similar to heart rate. Now, the question is, what value should I take into account? So I do usually wear two watches, they are currently charging. So my Garmin measures my resting heart rate, my Samsung also measures my resting heart rate. The question is now, do I take the current daily value, which goes up and down? So last night I, for example, had a resting heart rate of 43. Then a couple of nights ago I had maybe 54. So therefore also the biological age would update every time I would update this. So the question then also becomes when in the time, when during the day would I update this? And I asked also if they plan to do an automation of this, similar to how Inside Tracker, a blood interpretation uh, kind of service also automatically imports VO2 max from, from Garmin already and also resting heart rate from Garmin. Now, currently they are not doing this apparently, but what he mentioned is that Apple Health works already in a kind of similar fashion to Inside Tracker to, to, to Garmin. So they seem to be able to import the VO2 max estimate, I think from Apple Health, maybe also resting heart rate, but it seems to currently not work with Garmin. He also asked if I had connected my Garmin account to which I replied yes. Now, the question is for me, I do have these different time intervals in Garmin. I can access the current resting heart rate, then the seven day rolling average, which is not the last week, but the seven day rolling average, then the last month, also not the last month, actually, the calendar month, but the last 30 days rather, and then also I have the last year. The nice thing about the rolling, the rolling average is that it continues. It continues to improve, but it also continues to degrade if you actually have something that negatively impacts your health. Whereas if you just say, okay, I have this, this last year, then it's 2023, or, and then it's just one value, then this value doesn't change. So you have the long-term long average, but simultaneously it's including all of the new values. And this would be also be something that might make sense in terms of the EGM uh, strength age. But currently they seem to not be doing this. This and they probably s somewhat have a reason for doing this like this, at least I assumed. Now, the, what he mentioned is probably a month. So there would be the time frame of the day, the week, the month, the year. I actually recently switched it to yearly, but this has the, pr the problem that in terms of the cardiovascular input, so I do have to input my VO2 max estimate from Garmin manually, manually. Then I also have to input the resting heart rate as well as the blood pressure. Now, blood pressure and resting heart rate, I can get both for the year on average, read out, but also for the month and also for the last seven days. With VO2 max, I don't have an average readout because Garmin does not provide this. Now, one simplifying rule for, for things like this and actions like this in, in my case is that I only take data that I can kind of access and without 
further calculation. Of course, I could open up Excel and then do the spreadsheet calculation of this and this and this, and then and only add it to this. But this eventually just increases the complexity of this whole thing, or rather the complicatedness, up to the point where I don't want to do it, so therefore I just don't do it. Now, of course, I'm already inputting these values once weekly, also kind of to experiment with this, and also I want to be able to be maybe make a video about this. So I am currently doing this once a week and also taking my measurements once a week. What I do, do would I do this if I wouldn't report in any kind of fashion on this? I don't know. Probably also, <laughs> I assume, because I'm only reporting on the things that I'm also kind of otherwise doing. At least that's kind of the assumption of this. Now, the VL2 max in terms of Garmin is not an average, which means it's a ever revolving weekly measurement. So I do cu currently at least once a week run. And then if the run is flat and a certain distance, then it can make up a VO2 max estimate, which I then input. Uh, there is also the question of when I have a VO2 max estimate and similar with resting heart rate, should I then once a week input the data also if there is the same if the data stayed the same. So if my VO2 max as of currently is still 57 and the next week is also 57, should I include this data point? Um, to which he replied no, because there is no change. Now my thinking previously on this on this uh, question um, was for one, that it, that it would reduce basically the cost of entry, but the time cost of entry if I just wouldn't do it, if it still stayed the same. But then you also have the problem that the data is kind of missing. Because if you have a time interval of two months where there is basically uh, the VO2 max stays the same from 57 to 57, then in this period you just don't have any data. Whereas if you then have the data that Garmin actually told you, you would have at least one data entry point. This would be kind of the, the opposite thinking of what, the, what this uh, representative of eGym told me. Now the, I also have to mention this was not, um, I just asked this guy who was in the gym um, if he had, <laughs> yeah, well. So um, something else I asked him was whether for one, they would do a dark mode and to which he replied that the app I can access is kind of in terms of the design language adapted to my chimp chain. So uh, they are kind of tied to this. The second question was if there is a Garmin integration or something like this in plan, because it would reduce the cost of basically doing this, uh, to which he replied, maybe. The third thing was if you do, or basically I have two things left. The first is, can you do supersets? To which he answered yes, but not in this circle. So there are two different basically environments in which you can set up these these machines. The first one is a circle. So you have it in a circular fashion and then the user starts here and then does the next and the next and the next and if there are six people on six machines then they all are synchronized in terms of the time which means six people can use the machines at the same time. Now I usually do supersets in the gym mostly to save time so I can basically do twice as many exercises if in the exercise pause I do something else. I often then also use basically the opposite muscle group so if I have a pulling motion then the this, the second thing, the second exercise in the superset is then a pushing motion. Now, he mentioned that if you have it kind of as a standalone machine, you could just log in with the band you have. The, the bands might be different in different gyms or in different gym chains, or you might also have a card. And then you can just log in and do anything you would like. But in the circular fashion, it is kind of tied to the synchronized break times. So as you do one machine and you then would leave for the next machine, there is still the break time of the initial machine. So it is synchronized basically with your account in order to, uh, in order to uh, basically allow this rotation and therefore also the, the rest in between is set. So you cannot start another, the next session of, of, of reps at the next machine, even if you switch and are very fast in between. Now, an additional thing I asked is, so there are in the eGym Pro membership, there are now different kind of modes. So first there is an overall mode, uh, which you can set by the trainer in the gym. So there are, I think, are six different modes, something like hypertrophy, something like uh, building strength, and then four others like this. What seems to be most useful to me is maybe building strength or hypertrophy, which is um, what I think the trainer last time entered also. And then there are all these additional things. So there is normal exercise, then there is also the negative, which kind of, if you row, then it would pull very hard basically as it goes back. So this would be the negative. Then there is also 
isokinetic and a couple of other ones. I think three other ones. Now, if you want to change these, then you cannot set these, neither in the eGym app, which is kind of the app from my fitness, uh, from my fitness center, which is also made by eGym, or at least somewhat provided by eGym, but I cannot change it in there. And you have to basically manually log in and then change it to the thing. Now, would it, and his thinking, or what he explained that the thinking behind this was that it would automatically adapt, even not only in between positive and negative, but also in between all of these different programs. So as you just enter, you come, for example, and at any given day, you log in, and then it tells you basically, it does automatically the right program for you, even with isokinetic, and there are also these things where you hold and then push, and then there is a short break in between. So there are kind of a couple of different programs in order to optimize for, I don't know exactly what would be the goal, but probably a different compared to or depending compared on these overarching goals which the trainer can set. And so this was a short uh, short interview. I basically just bombarded him with a couple of questions. He seemed also, yeah, well, uh, I don't know what he seemed. Uh, he just answered the questions and then I left.